Welcome to The Bridge. I'm your host, Kira Young, and today we have a special broadcast going on to celebrate both the book called Engines of Domination and the visual representation. Um, I'd like to give you a special welcome. Mark Korski, welcome to The Bridge. Well, thanks, Kira. Thanks. It's very nice to be here. Um, so I've gotten partway through your book, and I'm already really excited about it. Um, it's it, it's very powerful because, well, namely, the, the main thing that really excites me is that um, I've thought for a long time about um, what we think of as human nature being a big lie. And that's what, what really uh, excited me is that you're, you're um, bringing this to light as well. That, well, look at all the, you know, 6,000 years of history, um, recorded history. Look at, it, look at all the rest of it where we lived in harmony. And that, that's more of a sign of what human nature really is. I think human nature is the crucial question today. A lot of people talk as if the world would be better if humanity were extinct. If you see memes going around on Facebook about what we are doing to the world, we have deforested, we have done this horrible thing and that horrible thing, and it isn't we as a species who are doing it. It's a very small part of the species that are in control of extremely powerful and unaccountable institutions that are doing it. And they've only been doing it this badly for the last couple of hundred years and the institutions have only been around for 6,000 years. We as a species survived somehow for a quarter of a million years without these institutions and without this destruction. So I think it's very important that we don't, we as people, we as a species, don't take the blame for what the worst of our species is forcing everyone to go along with doing and to think that because these horrible things are happening, and it obviously isn't being done by lobsters or mice, then we are the problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it's only a small part of we that are the problem. And when we, as a whole, take responsibility for it, we absolve those who are really responsible uh, for it, of, of their... We sure do. Yeah. And so um, perhaps... All of the the things that we do to try to change this this horrible human emergency that we're in um, get uh, corrupted by this idea. Um, like you can see it right now in the environmental movement that you know this idea that humans are a cancer on the planet. It's like no, <laughs> no, we're not. <laughs> we're part of the planet. We're an integral part of the planet. So how are we a cancer? because the small elite has um, dominated us for however many thousands of years, that doesn't make us a cancer, does it? Well, on the contrary, it makes them it, not so much like the cancer, uh, the destruction and the, the civilization, the institutions and civilization that have caused it have spread like a cancer, mm. but I think it's much more like weapons proliferation. The, the destructive institutions began 6,000 years ago on a very limited scale in just a couple of places on the planet. And gradually, well, within a couple thousands of years of then, there were several in, in Asia, the Middle East, a few thousand years later in Mesoamerica. Now those institutions and their reach have spread all over the planet, but it's the institutions that are the cancer, the, the uncontrolled growth that saps the life energy of the thing it's growing on and, and eventually will destroy it if it's not stopped. Mm -hmm. So let's get into the, your, your four key questions that you're asking um, in, in this book and, and get into those uh, in depth to, to come back around to what we're talking about here, um, which is what our true nature is. So the first question that you, that you ask is, is basically, you know, is political power necessary in its present form? Um, because it's it's exercised at the expense of the majority. You know, it's exercised at the expense of not only human suffering but um, mass destruction. 
when you have large complex communities, it's the only way they can be organized around armed central authority, the way it is universally done today. Mm -hmm. By armed central authority, of course, I mean the state and all of its apparatus Mm -hmm. uh, implemented through governments. I don't identify the two, government and armed central authority. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a technical point. Can you have large, complex communities without it? And the answer is clearly yes. Mm -hmm. Before the Bronze Age, the the Neolithic agricultural communities certainly weren't large compared with New York, but we're talking about populations of thousands living with very little evidence that there was anything like armed central authority. There weren't distinguished graves uh, for rulers filled with riches. There weren't distinguished dwellings where rulers would have lived. The first distinguished dwelling that appears in the Neolithic communities is actually the granary, the silo, where the surplus is stored, long before there's any sign that anyone lived any differently. And to have a community that could operate at a surplus means you had a fairly complex social organization. Also, there's very little evidence of of intensely institutionalized warfare. Certainly, there were probably conflicts between communities. There's always going to be conflict wherever you have human beings. We're we're not saints. We're we're very fallible and and damn feisty creatures uh, when push comes to shove. But there's, there's no evidence that there were large militaries or that fighting was in any way glorified in their art. So the answer is definitely yes. You can have large, complex communities without armed central authority. You need organization. You need some kinds of central organizations. But those can be operated along much more voluntary and traditional lines than anything we've seen since the beginning of civilization. And how, you know, uh, the question I, I asked last night is how would we intrinsically know that that we can live in a different way unless we had before? And we do know. We, we do know that we lived in a different way before. And this is the evidence that, that you're presenting and that so many others have presented in different ways. Um, you bring in the work of, I don't know how to really pronounce her name, but um, Marja... Maria Gimbutas. Yes. Which, um, Maria Gimbutas. Yes. Um, and how you know these, these uh, Neolithic cultures were, were basically centered around the relationship of motherhood and child, really, um, or what you could call goddess-centered cultures. But really, it's really around the relationship of mother and child. And, um, you know, it, the sacredness of that, um, that, that's kind of one of the things that I've been looking at probably my whole adult life is this, um, uh, that our nature... Um, is communally related and that none of us gets to um, survive without the help of others. That's the, that's the nature of, of um, human um, development and understanding is that, you know, we, we live in relation. That is human nature. And um, every, every part of the, um, this engine of domination denies that reality because it has to in order to, to maintain its power. But one of the things that, that, that really kind of blew my mind so far with reading this is um, my blog's called Psychopaths in Charge. So, you know, my, my main thesis was like, well, the things in the world are messed up because psychopaths are running. You can bring it all back to that. But the realization that I've come to so far in, in reading your work is that the psychopaths in charge are actually um, a necessary piece of that engine of domination. And that's why they're and without in the engine, they'd be powerless. Right. The engine selects for people like psychopaths to mm-hmm. make to make the most difficult decisions and do the things that cause the worst destruction. And it rewards people for doing that. It rewards them with privilege and luxury and authority and honor uh, and impunity from consequences of doing harm. But without without the means that this thing I call an engine provides, they would they would just be at most criminals on a personal scale. I'd like to mention before we go on, though, that there's much more evidence that human nature isn't anything like what we see destroying the world today. Mm -hmm. Peasant societies throughout the world, tribal societies in relatively uncorrupted parts of the world show that same kind of organization, that same kind of, of communities that are organized around a common good that everyone shares in and contributes to and identifies with rather than this individualistic, 
what can I get, uh, you know, me versus them, there's much more evidence that that's human nature. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And we can see, we can see vestiges of it in, in the way in which, um, tribal native elders, um, describe the time before, um, being colonized and taken over. Um, of course, tribal communities have been infected by the same engine of domination now, but we can see the vestiges of it, of, um, you know, collective, in, in, in the, the values that still exist today in Native um, cultures. They all point to that, that central, um, real human nature uh, that we have. And um, I talk about this a lot, but what the main teaching that I, I continue to learn from today from my Lakota family is that I was taught that we were here to learn how to be good relatives and uh we're related to all that lives um, <laughs> so um, i think that points to the central truth as well of our true nature and why we're really here and the psychopaths don't contradict that being a psychopath as i understand it simply means that you're able to commit commit harm to others without feeling remorse it doesn't mean you're inclined to necessarily. Mm. It doesn't. It, it's not the same as being a mass murderer who is out to inflict you know, horror and suffering on people. Mm. It's it's a lack of something that usually constrains normal people from causing harm intentionally. Mm-hmm. There's certainly a small. There, there are today and probably have always been a small number of people who take delight in causing harm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I suspect there are many more today, proportionally, than there have ever been, because there are all of these. Ins- what what what, do you, what can you make of a world where war is glorified, mm-hmm. where the wholesale destruction of of cities, of populations, uh, slaughter, torture, where all these things are done in the in the name of good causes? I think ever since war was institutionalized several thousand years ago, the example for causing harm being something that can be good has poisoned civilized cultures. But mm. even even the worst of people may have a lot of fine human qualities. But they aren't encouraged. They're actually rewarded. And, and so we probably don't have any more psychopaths than there were however many thousands of years. They just happen to be in the key positions that the engine requires to keep going. Yeah, they're they're running a much more powerful engine than any that ever existed before. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Hmm. Um, well, let's talk about technology for a little bit. And then we'll get on to the next uh, question that you ask. Because um, we're both, we before we came on, we, we discussed a little bit how we're kind of new to this. But, and, and, what what you're saying in your in your work about technology is that it's not inherently evil in itself but it's because it that technology is used for this engine of domination it that there's this unholy union of of um that that creates the the evil that that we're experiencing it's not the technology itself it depends on what you mean uh it's a very interesting exercise to ask someone what technology is. Mm-hmm. A lot of folks can't define it. It's become almost a magical word for the power of modern civilization, this, this power that emanates from something called science, which also not many people really understand. They've, they've gone, you know, I, I, I studied theoretical physics for three years at the graduate level. I know quite a lot about science mm-hmm. and I've studied a lot of philosophy of science, but what you learn in school about science is very far from what the thing really is as an adventure of ideas and creative imagination trying to create theories that enable us to understand and predict how nature works. Science and technology are almost like divinities in the modern world. They produce marvels that very, very few people can begin to understand. I'm sitting here in front of a little black box alone in my room speaking and 
somehow you're hearing me and so are all of these people around the planet. Uh, I can vaguely understand how that goes on. And there are some people who understand it completely, but to most people it's magic. Mm. And technology means the power of this magic to change our lives. And of course it's supposed to change them for the better. I would much rather have my beautiful little new Lenovo ThinkPad than the first notebook no, uh, notebook computer I ever had. We would much rather have air conditioning. We would much rather have, you know, you know what I'm saying. Yeah. It's supposed to make things better, and this is all supposed to be part of this wonderful adventure that humanity is engaged in called progress. Mm-hmm. And I think this is all a myth. If you really look at what technology means, as an anthropologist looks at it, or as a as a scholar of technology look at looks at it. It comes down to systematic ways of making and doing things. Since the scientific revolution, that's increasingly been the sort of thing that makes the magic that I was just talking about and that has transformed the world, both in some ways and for some people, for the better, and at least as far as the habitat's concerned, very much for the worse. But systematic ways in making, of making and doing things goes back millions of years before our species, some of the earliest hominids made tools. They, they mastered the use of fire. Almost all of the things we take for granted in daily life, like cooking, like containers, your house is a container. Once upon a time, no one used containers. The innovation of, pick, of using one thing to contain and carry or store other things was enormous. We take all these for granted. Well, that's not technology. Technology is my laptop. Not so. That's technology. We are tool makers. We harness external sources of energy to our advantage. And the tools are an intrinsic part of how we do it. It's part of our nature. It's it's what sets us apart from all other species, in my opinion, especially if you extend the definition of tool to mean things like language, which is another unbelievable creation of our species. Mm-hmm. So I think when people identify technology with the science-based technology of the last few centuries, that's a very vague and dangerous way of thinking that makes it easy to blame technology for what I call the human emergency, Mm -hmm. to think that we should do away with technology and somehow live without it, but that would mean living without all the things that hominids have been using for millions of years. Not a possibility. Without technology, you're going to be picking things off trees and digging them out of the ground with your bare hands, naked. You get what I'm saying? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's it's the very myth of progress that informs our our very ideas about what technology is. Yeah, it's a superhuman power with the superhuman power of science behind it. Mm -hmm. And it's like a living thing. It develops. It advances. It isn't a question of someone sitting in a corporate boardroom with a bunch of advisors and engineers talking about how to increase their profits that determines what new wonderful things are going to fall into our enchanted hands. It's some magical force moving on its own, transforming the world and carrying us along with it. It's nonsense, and it's very dangerous nonsense. Mm -hmm. And that and it's um, nonsense, nonsense that is reinforced as well on a cultural level on, on many different it's, avenues. It's hyped. General <laughs> Electrics. When I was a kid, uh, Ronald Reagan was a, a, an advertising spokesman for General Electric, and their slogan was, Progress is our most important product. Mm. I General remember. Electric, by the way, used to make the re-entry nose cone vehicles for hydrogen bombs. Hmm. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> so, um, part of, uh, how our, how we can accept, um, these sort of dangerous memes into our thinking and into our lives and into our daily living um, really has to do with this this myth of what progress really is, and that um, you know we were naked and dumb and stupid and you know starving before um, <laughs> before the 
advent of civilization. And and that too, um, you know, that myth is reinforced um, in in uh, in our religion. You know, in in our religions like uh, the like you bring up the Adam and Eve myth, um, and how that sort of reinforces our our idea about um, what progress really is, um, and that we deserve the toil that we and and slavery that we find ourselves in. Because we're toiling for a better future, too. We deserve it because we fell from grace, according to the, the Christian original sin idea. I think the fall from grace was the invention of domination, mm-hmm. when some human beings turned against others and decided to use them to their own advantage. But, yeah, if we're, if we're cursed with original sin, then we deserve to suffer. But progress can deliver us from this original sin, you see, mm. because even if we're still suffering today, working in sweatshops, working two jobs to barely raise a family, living in a, a, a toxic environment, whatever, we're doing it for our f- future. We're doing it for our, our, for our descendants. We're doing it for the sake of whatever progress is progressing toward. That's the key f- fallacy in progress. You can progress toward a goal. But without a goal, progress is meaningless. So what is the goal of this progress? Is it some kind of absolute perfection in human life? What would that be? And even if there were such a thing, once you achieved perfection, you'd have to stop progressing and then nothing could change or it wouldn't be perfect anymore. But somehow this, this shining future ahead of us, uh, news people, propagandists talk in terms of moving forward or moving backward, mm-hmm. as if that that goal is out there and we're either moving closer to it or we're regressing from it. I think this is all nonsense. The future does not exist. The future is an idea. And we can certainly have more or less accurate ideas about what it may be like now, later, so to speak. It's very difficult to talk about time. But the notion that the future lies ahead of us like the end of a movie lies ahead when you start watching it or the end of a book is absurd. Human, the universe is creative. Human beings are creative. The, the activities that are going on that are changing the world for better or worse that are going to make now a very different thing a year from now than now is now, those make it impossible to even accurately predict big things about the future. It's all an idea. So this notion of moving through time as if we're moving through space is very deceptive and just doesn't bear close thinking at all. Yeah, because when, once you are able, like you say, once you're able to look at something in a different way, it changes you. Instantly. Instantly, yeah. Yeah, so not only does um, this engine of domination um, use people, but uses ideas as well. And so these ideas that could be used for creative purposes um, in our lives or for the common good are actually used to to rationalize or justify things as they are. Yes, and I think it's important not to imply that this means that there are some kind of malevolent masterminds cooking these ideas up for that purpose. Mm -hmm. It's a selective process. When someone looks at their world and tries to understand it, I think they're going to tend to try to put a good light on it and a bad one. And looking at very destructive things going on, it's a lot easier to read that in terms of moving it being part of a process that's moving towards something better or something that has some great moral or ideological or even cosmological justification than to really frankly look at how bad it might be. So ideas are spun up by people maybe partly through wishful thinking, maybe partly through just projecting the best upon an ambiguous situation that can be read in several ways. And then those ideas get selected out and endorsed if those in power feel that they're of advantage and the ones that are more challenging get selected negatively against and condemned. So the the ways of thinking in our zeitgeist that 
glorify and aggrandize what's going on don't have to be thought up for the purpose of of justifying something bad, but they can be co-opted to that end. Right. Right. So, <laughs> that I mean, that is, um, I, I mean, I, I'm at a loss of the language to use to describe what, uh, because I, I was thinking, well, that sort of moves me forward, you know, that there's, there's not, uh-huh. this, you know, <laughs> so, but then again, I'm, you know, I'm in that that framework of, of of thinking when I think of myself moving forward, but uh, <laughs> it moves me. I'll put it, it that way. <laughs> well, it moves you to something you think is better, and we've come to identify better as forward somehow. Right. Don't have to be. Right. Right. Because we within us we know um, what we were built for. I mean, when when we get set up by the stress of living. Um, in the state that we live in now, we say to ourselves and our friends, you know, we're, we're not built for this. We're just not built for this. You know, that that's the reframe that when people are fed up with how with the state of affairs as they are. But how do we know we're not built for it? Because well, we do we know. feel it to begin yeah. with. <laughs> yeah. yeah. In our in when our you look at the Excuse me. In our aching bones. Aching bones, aching souls. Uh, yeah. I glance at, at my Facebook news feed most any day, and I see so many people looking for and offering advice about about how to how to live better, how to feel better, how to how to cope. And it just says to me that people's souls are crying out that this that things are not right, that they are not right, that they are they're suffering in deep ways and there must be at least a way to get get through these difficulties, but that it they are difficult. Mm-hmm. Why should life be difficult in that way? Life's plenty difficult. It's plenty difficult to get along with people and provide for yourself to accomplish what you want and not to make mistakes and to correct the ones you've made. Life's plenty hard enough. But why should our souls be suffering like this? That we need all of these little gems of wisdom that, that come out in the memes, that all the advice, all the consolation, all the practices to correct for things, uh, all the reassurances. It's a pretty sad state of affairs. So I do want to talk to you also a little bit about culture and identity and um, what you what you refer to as the deadly collective we. And then I have a question a for big... you. So describe what you mean by the deadly collective we. Well, that's what I was talking about at the beginning of our conversation, where we, you and I, take responsibility as a species for what some members of our species are doing. Suppose someone says, look at the Holocaust. What a horrible example of man's inhumanity to man. And then suppose that instead I said, well, look at that man who, who tortured his child. What a horrible example of man's inhumanity to children. It sounds different somehow, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Because when you see someone torturing his child, you see one criminal doing something horrible. But somehow when you look at a state like Nazi Germany doing something extremely horrible to a whole to several classes of people, we can say humanity did that. We've been trained to take the crimes of our rulers upon ourselves, and therefore to identify with our rulers and the perpetrators of crimes against us. So the deadly collective we is my my catchy little phrase for when people speak as if humanity is committing the crimes, the atrocities, that only those in power are committing, and thereby take responsibility for that, and to some extent let those who are actually doing it off the hook from the responsibility that's theirs alone. So is there a, uh, a a living collective we, or is that what human nature is? Is that what you're describing as, as our true human nature? Well, I think we can say a lot about we as a species, but one of the things you have to say about us as a species is that we're incredibly diverse. 
Some of our species write great poems. Some of our species lead their nations off to war. I think you just have to be careful between the between to distinguish between the general qualities of us as a species and the particular doings that some parts of our species do and draw the line between saying humanity writes immortal poems and there are great poets. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The actions that people do, the accomplishments that they make, are a very different thing than what kind of creature we are. We're a creature who can do those things, but most of the creatures don't do most of the things that people do. Only a few people do them, the good ones and the bad ones. We sure have a lot in common with one of the reasons the Deadly Collective We works is people naturally identify with groups. They identify with their families. They identify with their communities. They identify with people of like beliefs and so forth. It's very natural for people to bond into groups because we're community beings. We've always lived in communities. So this natural tendency gets exploited by ways of thinking that serve those in power. It's perfectly natural to talk when I I live in Taos, New Mexico, to say, we here in Taos, blah, blah. You know, like we have a beautiful community. Uh, we, we're, we're in a beautiful setting. We don't really have a beautiful community in some ways. There's a lot of conflict here, like most places. But it's such a natural tendency to identify with groups of people that it's easy for that to leap to the species when it's not appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. I see where you're going with that. That's um, an important distinction, and it and it works, you know. And, and I can I'm just seeing how this works, and so and even in our own cultural, you know, identity, um, like you're saying, you know, we here in Taos, or you know, we Indians, or we, um, you know, whoever, uh, we Americans, we, and how. Um, how this this natural leaning to to be a we is both our um, I'm not going to say salvation, but in a way, it's both our salvation and our destruction, because the engine uses that that the engine needs that. So for you, I haven't got to the end of the book or anything. What's the solution? What is the um, yeah? What's the solution? To how um, our, I don't know our, if there's a solution. Yeah, yeah. I know. I know what would need. I know what needs to be done to save the world from being destroyed by political power. What needs to be done is to abolish political power, or at least to throttle it back and tame it so much that it's almost unrecognizable compared with what we have today. That's absolutely necessary. Mm-hmm. One. One serious nuclear war would cause more damage to the world than most people ever have or would care to imagine, and it's still possible. It's possible any time by accident. You know, there have been numerous times when the world was a breath away from an all-out nuclear war between the United States and the Soviet Union. As recently, the last one I know of was, I think, in 1995. We have these tremendously complicated computerized systems that, the, that operate these weapons. The United States and Russia have thousands of them. They used to have tens of thousands. In, in, the, in the 1980s, there were 70,000 nuclear weapons. Now, I haven't looked up the figures recently. I think maybe there's something like on the order of, of 2,000 in both arsenals, give or take a few hundred. One nuclear bomb causes a tremendous amount of destruction. A serious exchange between the United States and Russia, which could be precipitated by accident any time, could devastate both of those countries. That's just one example, Mm -hmm. the destruction of the habitat that's going on. Mm -hmm. There are contaminants, atmospheric contaminants, ground-based, groundwater, oceanic contaminants, radioactive contamination, that if the production stopped today, would continue to cause damage for generations. So the mechanism that is causing all that is 
either political power itself or is enabled by political power. People wouldn't allow the kinds of, of destructive, of environmentally destructive things to happen in their neighborhoods if they had a choice. No one asks if you want a coal-powered, a coal-fired power plant in your backyard. The state allows it to be put in, and then the company runs it and makes money from running it. So the, this, amount, this kind of destruction is going to continue and worsen and eventually make the world at least unfit for human life or destroy human life if the institutions aren't abolished. I have no idea how it can be done. Mm-hmm. I don't think there's any, there's certainly no simple fix like the little missile up the Death Star in Star Wars. I know it can be reformed. I know it can be reduced. There are lots of historical examples of ex- extremely successful movements to reform political institutions in certain ways. And the way we've got to reform most urgently is to reduce the threat of nuclear war and hopefully abolish nuclear weapons and put tremendous throttles on the destruction of the habitat. But as to how it can be done, that's one of those questions for the future. I have a lot of suggestions about things. I could talk in particular about what can be done to counteract thought control. I'll be glad to in a minute. But we're in a situation that's never existed before. A global system of power is developing, and a global awareness of the problem that that system poses is developing at the same time. A global resistance is taking form against this global system. Many people are getting hurt an awful lot worse than we're getting hurt in the United States. They are doing something about it. I don't know what, but the amount of organization and intercommunication between movements to oppose this system today is incomparably greater than it was just even when I started working on this book a decade ago. What's going to happen is that people are going to get hurt very badly, there are going to be disasters, and they're going to respond in courageous and creative ways that none of us can foresee. And those in power are going to react to those challenges in ways we can't foresee. It's going to be an incredible drama. I I don't even try to picture it, and I certainly don't try to call the outcome about whether it's going to be a final solution or just a reprieve or a defeat. I have no idea. I have lots of hopes because I believe that people have it in them to accomplish wonders if they know what they're doing and they stick to the task and stick together in organized ways to do it. But if I thought I knew the solution, I would be out screaming it from the rooftops to people. Mm -hmm. And if I could think of a solution, those in power could probably think of the countermeasure against the particular solution I thought of. We've got to let it play out and do our best in what ways we can to move toward that solution. But it's not going to be easy and it's not going to be quick. Mm. So the um, it's it's really important that we do look at the ways in which our perceptions are are managed and and uh, controlled um, because that's you know I to me that seems the natural place to start because that's where um, that's where we're led astray is that we really don't understand. What what's actually happening because our our perceptions are literally um, sort of fed to us in a way. Um, so it's thinking our we have to think ourselves out of that um, illusion in order to again <laughs> I don't have the words move forward <laughs> out of where we're at or you know climb ourselves out of this um, hole or, or this emergency. Thought control. Thought control has been around since the earliest systems of political power in the form of state religions. There it mostly operated, it operated most effectively on the upper classes, like the, the priests and the, and the scribes in ancient Egypt. And that, that continued to be the case pretty much until the last two or the last maybe 300 years. The lower classes were certainly indoctrinated by state religions, you know, to be submissive and to detest themselves for their sins and to fight against their sinful nature and to obey the authorities and, you know, basically to be parts of the mechanism while they were busy with those other things. But in modern times, 
thought control has really become essential to the way political power works at the popular level since the invention of cheap mass print, especially since the invention of mass media, and with the, the establishment of compulsory public schooling. It's now essential for the way political power works, especially in what we call the democracies, like the, you know, like the, the so-called good guys on the world scene today, especially the United States. Thought control doesn't mean a hypnotic, robotic kind of programming of people's minds. It means restricting the issues that can be discussed. It means creating artificial issues to motivate people to make decisions like uh, creating or hyping crises to, to justify getting into wars or threatening people uh, with terrible things happening if they don't support wars. It's very subtle. It also, it also operates by keeping people from having the time to think. Who has the time to think when you're working two jobs, raising a family, come home exhausted, and all you want to do is, is, is have a beer and, and watch a movie and rest up for doing more of it tomorrow? And when all the distractions are so much more interesting and wonderful, than the ugly things you might have to face if you were going to try to figure out what the world is really about. Thought control is essential. If somehow magically the thought control system in the United States vanished right now, I firmly believe there would be a revolution overnight. It's, it's that essential to the way the system operates. Therefore, it's a tremendous vulnerability of the system. And if you've got an enemy, you you need to attack their weakest point. I think anything we can do to counteract thought control, first by really getting in touch firmly with reality ourselves, and understanding what's going on and why and what's at stake for those in power to have it working this way, but then jostling people, raising questions, being willing to disturb how people think, pointing people to reliable sources of information, thinking in public. Thinking is not a very popular activity here in the United States. This is a profoundly anti-intellectual culture. You can be clever, you can be glib, you can be funny or obscene or all kinds of, of things in, in, in clever and intelligent ways, but really thinking is pretty much pretty much out of the, out of the spotlight now. I think people are starved for it. I think people deeply want to understand their world, and they deeply want to understand how they might be able to make a difference in how the world works. So by attacking thought control in any way we can, ad lib, uh, something comes up in a conversation, whatever, any of that will be helpful. And if we could really seriously increase the number of people who are out of the grip of the thought control system, I figure that's maybe... I really figure maybe two out of three people are more in the thrall of the system than not. It's not everybody by any means. And not one, any individual may be much more in the thrall of thought control about some matters than others. So if we could edge that proportion to where more people were out of it than in it, more of the time, that could have un, 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 unbelievable effects in changing how people did other things without trying to figure out what they ought to do and trying to get them to do it, trying to organize to do it. Just increasing the awareness that way and the awareness of the thought control system as a system. Like I like to put it that it's almost the opposite of that moment in The Wizard of Oz when Toto pulls the curtain aside and the wizard said, says, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Pay attention to the machine the guy is operating. He didn't have the machine, he'd just be some goofball. Pay attention to make people actually see that there is a thought control system in the corporate press, in the corporate media, in the way governments around the world operate through those channels, in how even universities and schools. My God, have you heard about this this recent the recent school board vote in Colorado, where a Denver school board, I believe, adopted a measure to restrict the curriculum to things that could cause people to dissent against the United States. There were student protests. It was awesome. Uh -huh. And the last I heard, the school board had passed the movement. I hope that's not true. But at how thought to make people aware of thought control as a mechanism, 
And pretty amazing things might follow from just that one step alone. Not that I'm saying it's the only thing we can or should do, but I think it's the most important and it's the easiest. It, it's a thing you can do one-to-one on a personal basis with people you know. Yeah, and it, and it's uh, the first thing that really becomes apparent. And when, when you were talking about um, the, the system that, that keeps us so exhausted that we can't even think and the anti-intellectual America that we live in, I was thinking about how, you know, the the poisons um, that, you know, we're all experiencing, you know, in our food supply and our water and everything, it's making us sick. That's a whole nother level of what, what keeps us from actually being able to think. And, um, you know, I mean, they even call some of the symptoms of, you know, autism, autoimmune disease and all these things that are, you know, on the rise at levels beyond our comprehension um, are because uh, of this engine that allows for the destruction of, of life in the name of profit. You know, that's a whole other thing that keeps us from, from thinking because we're always in a health crisis. And, you know, you, how can you think when you're trying to live? And, you know, so... Um, <laughs> but once you once you see it, or once you lift that veil, so to speak, it, it's really hard to um, unsee it. But many of us do because the reaction by the system to thinking <laughs> or to pointing out, look at the look at the machine, um, is is so violent, and not just by that those in charge. It it, it supports itself so. Um, people fight to to maintain that illusion that that they were indoctrinated to, um, you know. So we we have this left right uh, manufactured uh, dynamic that you know if we just if we just uh, progress with you know left wing politics or we just progress with right wing politics that we'll progress. Again, the myth of progression to a to a better America. Um, Help us, yeah, yeah. There's a deep dynamic too behind what you were what you were saying about people wanting to believe the the illusion. It's it's the dynamic of, of abuse. An abused child very often will excuse her abuser. You know, he only loves me, or I really deserved it, because it's much more terrifying to believe that you're at the mercy of someone malevolent or evil then that there's something wrong with you it's much easier to take the blame than to feel so powerless all it takes is one really good supportive person in the child's life to secure them in the belief that they aren't the problem Mm -hmm. but there is a very natural and well-documented tendency to excuse the abuser because it's too terrifying to believe that you're in such a terrible situation. Same thing with the world today. It's much easier to think, I don't know what's going on. Oh, they must have reasons for doing it. Oh, that's just my opinion. Oh, those leftists, they just want to ruin everything. Than to really believe that something as malevolent and dangerous is in power as people are living under. So fear um, keeps it in place. Um, Yep. mm -hmm. That's the... That's its food, <laughs> so to speak. Um, that's its fear food. is its most powerful weapon. Mm-hmm. Fear and hate. Weapon and fuel, I would say. Um, so, um, let's talk a little bit about um, the gl- global capitalism and how that fits into this uh, into this engine. Well, to do that, I should explain a little bit about why I call it an engine. Okay. Uh, Most discussions of politics and power are framed in terms of political systems. Monarchy, theocracy, democracy, fascism, communism, socialism, uh, these different kinds of isms that refer to how particular systems of power organize their subjects. And I 
look at it very differently. I backed off many years ago when I started trying to figure all this stuff out for myself and, and tried to look at it just in terms of how you would have to go about capturing the human energy of a community to serve your own purposes. And as I, the more I did that, I really began to think that the, the institutions you need to create to do it function like the parts of an engine. An engine is a device that converts energy into useful work. And by human energy, I don't mean something metaphysical or esoteric. I mean the part of our biological energy that goes into purposeful human action. So how would you have to do it? And without going into a lot of technical details, I decided that you had to do it in, in a quite definite way with institutions that several separate kinds of institutions that each accomplish a definite purpose, like keeping the rulers organized is one thing you have to do. If they're just all flaming around like the Keystone Cops, you're not going to be able to stay in power. And you've got to have weapons, and you have to be able to control the land where your subjects live, things like that. Once I, I decided on that, suddenly I wasn't thinking in terms of systems at all. The components of this engine, this device that captures the human energy for the authority and privilege of the rulers, are there in all of those systems in slightly different forms. So, returning to your question, through the centuries after the, after the, after the end of the Middle Ages, when power started consolidating into the cities, and then a couple centuries after that, into the, the newly autonomous states around the time of the, of the, of the English Revolution. There's, since that time, there's been a steady increase in the fusion of independent financial power and state power that's gone through several different stages. Uh, recently, from the late... Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm fumbling my dates here. But from the, from the late 18th to the 19th century, the predominant form in the Western powers was industrial capitalism, where the financial interests were in industrial production more than trade, like had been the case during the colonial empires. And the fusion of power was between that kind of financial power and, of course, banking, which is just the top of the, the capitalist food chain that runs through all of these systems. That was that was the predominant system until late in the 19th century. Then in the United States, the business interests began eroding the constraints that had been placed against corporations. Some people may not know this, but in, in the early days of the United States, back to the time of the Constitution, there were powerful attempts to write into law, things that constrain what ac what activities corporations could actually take. There was even some people even wanted to write it into the constitution, but eventually it was left in the pan in the hands of the states. There were severe restraints, especially on banking, as to how a business could operate. It could only operate generally in it could only do one thing. You couldn't have a railroad and a coal company. It could only operate in a certain region. It could only operate. Uh, uh, you could operate a railroad, but you couldn't, over, you couldn't own the lands around where the railroad ran and so forth. Because the people in the early United States had really suffered under the British trading companies, the British East India Company and so forth. They knew that corporate power was incredibly dangerous. And if you were going to have a chance at anything like a free country or anything like a democracy, that had to be throttled. Plus, some of the founding aristocrats certainly wanted to have in their own hands the power that the trading companies had had before. In any case, in the late 19th century, those constraints started being eroded state by state. And when one state would laxen its restrictions on business activity, business would move there and the other states would suffer. So by the early 20th century, much of that had been removed. You had the Santa Clara decision, that, the Supreme Court decision that ruled that, that corporations could be regarded legally as persons in terms of certain rights. And that continued quietly and very powerfully through the 20th century, so that in the last in the last hundred years, this really quite new modern system of corporate, international corporate power 
has basically become the ruling form of the engine today. It's still the same old engine. It still has the same basic components, but now this is how those components execute their functions. Did that answer your question? <laughs> well, yes. I mean, it, it actually puts um, into into focus the way that I've think, been thinking about the rise of corporations and, you know, um, the, the danger that, that, that corporations pose to um, our, our well-being, you know, the well-being not only of human life but all life, in that, you know, profit is put over um, the value of, of life. And so um, I've always looked at it as an, as an organized um, uh, phenomena that the, 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 that the elite have, have, you know, systematically destroyed any control that there was over um, the corporations and banks and things like that um, in order to, or, in, or any emerging control, I should say, because there's never really been control over it. But, um, um, so it, it, there was a lot of control in the early United States. Yeah, but I mean, over time, there there hasn't been a lot of it. the the yeah, exactly yeah. Um, so I I never realized that it that um, yeah I never I never realized that uh, it didn't have to be systematic. Although it is, I mean, it's presented as that um, as a systematic decline of um, of uh, control over the over that mechanism but it's actually part of it it's actually p one other piece of of how um, this engine works and how um, the engine of domination works is that so it, it works today it yeah today today the danger about the corporations is not just that they have military powers like the United States working as their strongmen, but that something really quite inhuman has happened institutionally here that no one ever intended. Certainly, the great financiers and industrialists in the 19th century wanted to make great fortunes. They wanted to make money. They were often big philanthropists. They did a lot of good with their money. These, we're not talking about, we're talking about probably pretty cold-hearted and ruthless men but we're not talking about monsters who were just somehow fixated on getting another buck and not giving a damn about the world. That, that, I don't think that was the case at all. But the legal organization that was built into these institutions has created institutions that are machines dedicated to making a profit. The corporation is chartered to pay dividends to its shareholders. That is its purpose. Now, I think it's one thing if say I'm running a small business selling something I make and I want to walk away with a little more than I put into it, of course I do. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with profit as such. But I would like to only get that profit if I actually feel the person who I'm getting the money from also feels that they benefit just as much as I feel I benefit, which means I've got to do something really good for them. I want them to really benefit. But once I've decided that my first goal is to make money and everything else is subordinate, and I'm bound into an institution that demands that I make decisions so that I make the most money, I can't put human well-being first any longer. I may want to. I may try. I may succeed sometimes. But I may succeed a whole lot better at making those bottom lines get bigger and bigger if I disregard those things. And that's what's happened. These institutions have become impersonal mechanisms whose built-in purpose is increasing profit. And once that's the overriding goal, everything else is secondary. Whether you're providing something that's really good for people or doesn't do them any good or hurts them or, do, or you're providing it in a way that destroys the habitat or providing something that makes it possible to kill, one hydrogen bomb could easily kill 10 million people in a matter of minutes. These are being built by corporations. All of that ceases to matter mm -hmm. when the most important thing is this abstract profit that you, as, a, as an executive, as a worker, whatever, that you are locked into 
seeking. That's deadly. There's never been such a deadly thing let loose in the world before. So how can we really be complicit um, when, um, you know, because a lot of people say, well, stop paying your taxes and don't buy things from these corporations. Well, you know, the fact that I don't use Roundup doesn't stop my neighbors from using Roundup. You know, um, we can all make personal decisions that are are for the better, but that doesn't mean that the ways in which we are forced into cooperating with the system makes us complicit because there's no consent. I mean, it's like saying that a baby is complicit in their own, you know, infant circumcision. You, you know, it's... Exactly, or a woman in her own rape if she doesn't fight her assailant to the death. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I we're, think that um, has become a dangerous We're forced theme. into these... Sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. Please go ahead. Um, I think that's a dangerous meme as well that, that that's put out there. Not that we don't have personal responsibility and shouldn't take as much as we can, but that we're complicit in our own slavery or we're complicit in the way the world is now because they never asked for our consent and we never gave it. So that means that we are not complicit. We're certainly not complicit. We do contribute to the destructive processes very slightly. Yes, if you pay taxes, some of those are going to go to bad things. Yes, if you patronize a, an evil corporation, that's going to cause some destruction. Yes, if you drive a car, you're going to cause a tiny bit of pollution, landfills, all this sort of stuff. But you have there you have to weigh the alternatives, I think, and you have to see it in perspective. I use less electricity in a year, probably, than one big piece of power machinery in a factory uses in a day. Yes, there are hundreds of millions of me, but the amount that I would reduce the destruction by ceasing to consume what I consume is infinitesimal. Same thing with the pollution from my car. Same, same thing with many other slightly destructive effects of my way of living. And certainly, there's nothing... I, I, I applaud people who have the conviction and the courage to live in ways that cause less destruction, according to their convictions, whether it's something as simple as recycling or people who are vegan for moral reasons. I, I admire them very much, but the effects of their individual actions are microscopic. They could be... The effects could be much greater if organized groups, large organized groups, took similar actions in strategic ways. Boycotts are a very good example. Tax resistance can work when large numbers of people resist the taxes. So it's it's an issue that I hope I have an opportunity to mention, that, that organized human action is really our only hope against those in power because they're highly organized. Individuals can do things that can make a difference for the better or the worse. But when people come together in organized groups and act with a purpose and sustain that purpose over time, they, they get a superhuman power, just like the superhuman power of those in power. So to, to turn it around, these tiny little differences that individuals can make for the better or the worse can really be amplified and not just added up. It's not as if 10,000 people involved in a tax revolt are 10,000 times as powerful as one, it's much greater because there's an organized block of the populace that's opposing things. So there's the promise. Mm -hmm. that if enough people feel that they should take those actions and take them together in coordinated ways, that could have considerable impact in enforcing the hands of those in power to make certain reforms. It won't change the fundamental institutions at all. That's going to take something much, much more difficult. But it could make things a lot better in certain ways. True. Yeah. So, you know, my not using Roundup here you, you, affects me in a limited way, but it's still a good thing to do, not to buy it. Sure. And maybe when you're walking by it, um, you know, in the store or whatever, just happen to mention <laughs> to the person next to you what horrible poison it is <laughs> and how it's making everyone sick. You know, you might want to do that, too. And someone might say, hey, you know, and the things that it's it's used to kill, 
you know, the weeds and things like that are actually medicine that we can all use to make our lives better. You know, so it, mm-hmm. it those are those are important differences. And I think when we when we really know that we're not complicit, when we really accept that fundamental truth, um, it actually uh, has this effect of empowering us more in those daily decisions and making us um, uh, in, in freeing the way that we look at our daily lives. Um, that no, I didn't ask for this. Uh, I did. I don't deserve this. It's a, it's this. You're right in a, in in um, in 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 that it's it is similar to um, how people uh, heal from abuse is by <laughs> accepting that fundamental truth that I'm not complicit in in, in this. Um, and it works the same way on this um, fundamental emergency that we're um, talking about. So would you like to go on to the other questions? <laughs> I think we're, we're going around in, in sort of circles here, but it's good. It's helping me to understand your work um, better, and hopefully it will help the listeners understand it a little bit better, too. I think we well, sure. we've t- we've touched on a few of the other questions. Let's go have. on through them. Yeah. So the second one, given that a small faction um, intends to rule and enjoy inordinate privileges at the expense of the community, what are the means necessary to attain that end? Well, we've been talking about those means, right? Those things I call the components of the engine, the kinds of institutions that a group needs to use if it's going to capture the human energy of a community. Mm-hmm. And given that these means exist that we've been talking about um, and are used for that, that purpose, what's the inevitable consequences of doing so? And that's the human emergency. A large part of the book, and I think one of the most important, is that I try to show really indefinite ways how once power exists, once political power has been invented, I guess I, 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 that, that's what I need to mention that I haven't. I've, I've said that I don't believe you need to have armed central authority in order for large, complex communities to function well, although you need some kinds of central organization. The critical question is, do institutions like armed central authority naturally come up for some reason? And if so, for what reasons? I think it's much better to view it as an innovation. Hmm. That by the by the end of the Neolithic, when there were these large and in Neolithic terms, very wealthy communities operating at a surplus, you know, I don't mean people were driving Rolls Royce uh, buggies around, but I mean there was a there was plenty of life support. There there was food. There was shelter. There was certainly enough stuff for trade between communities, maybe even distant communities. Once you had communities that were that wealthy and that highly organized, the possibility arose of taking one of our fundamental traits as a species, domestication, and applying that to your fellow human beings. The agricultural communities in the late Neolithic had been developed only because plant and animal domestication had been so successful. And then possibility naturally comes to mind. Why shouldn't I domesticate my community and get them to work for me, just like the oxen are working for us now? I don't mean to imply that some genius or psychopath actually thought that thought explicitly, although I don't know how someone could possibly have avoided how it's possible that no one ever did. But the intention could appear just because the opportunity naturally arose to take a little bit of advantage of people in a small way. And once that had been successful, to take a little more advantage. Then once that process, that kind of avalanche, was started, if it was to continue, it had to be carried out in certain ways. The innovation was the idea to turn domestication on one's own kind. And what was necessary to make the innovation successful was to create the engine. So thinking of it as an innovation and as a tool, to me, makes it clear that it doesn't have to be understood as something that human communities naturally do 
the way if you've got a bunch of ants, you're going to have an anthill. Or if you've got a bunch of bees, you're going to have a hive or a wolf pack with dominance relations and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. It, 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 brought, incredibly creative. it broadens the understanding to look at it as an innovation rather than a, a, a natural progression in, in quotes. Well, and it's more optimistic because if it was an innovation, then that doesn't mean it's something that's built into our nature or something that we simply have to have because that's how our communities have to work. And it may mean that we can surpass that incredible innovation with an even bigger one, which is some kind of innovation that I can't imagine that could counteract political power, neutralize it, and make it impossible in the future. But the fact that we're talking about this and that you wrote your book and now there's going there's this visual representation that's coming out on the 17th with um, lifting the veil. Um, it's I think it's the reason why um, Thomas Sheridan uses the word consciousness insurgent. You know, it, it takes putting these um, this way of understanding out there for that great innovation to be born, to come forth, to bubble up. It can only help. It can't hurt. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm really optimistic about this film. Do you, should I tell your listeners about it? Yes, please do. About nine months ago, one of the best things that's ever happened in my life happened. I found a friend request on Facebook, and here's an interesting and serious-looking young man named Justin Jezuski. And as soon as I friended him and, and saw his timeline, he posted that he, he bought my book and was reading it and thought it was really good. So we got into a conversation, and he told me that uh, he works with, with Carrie Lee Miller at Lifting the Veil and makes documentary films. And before long, he proposed making a documentary about my book, Engines. And at first, I was kind of skeptical, because I'm a philosopher and a writer. I could not imagine a movie about ideas. But he seemed to know what he was doing, and I liked him, and agreed that we should we should go ahead with it. And to make a long story short, this coming Friday, the 17th, we're releasing an incredible one-hour film that really captures two of the most important ideas in my whole theory of political power. Uh, in a beautiful, I think, and gripping way, and so far... The, the pre-release cuts have gotten very positive reviews from people. It, it brings it brings the ideas to life in a way I'd never imagined, and it kind of it drags me into the 21st century. I'm I'm a, I'm a word person, and I have a very hard time even sitting still for most movies because I get bored. There's I keep waiting to see what's going to come next, especially documentaries, where you might have maybe 20 minutes worth of, of verbal content in an hour movie or something. This one is not like that. Every it's it's a nonstop experience of ideas and evocative images and some very deeply moving things. I'm 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 thrilled that this may reach a whole sector of people with my ideas who would never possibly get it through the book. And I, I want to emphasize I am not out to convince people that I'm right. Kira, my whole yeah. purpose is to inspire people to think about political power. If they think through what I've said about it and disagree with it, I am delighted that they've done the thinking. If it inspires them to think of something better, better yet. I just want to raise these issues that are, I think, very seldom discussed. And I believe that if enough people if enough people think about them on their own as I thought about it on my own for so many years, they'll come to the right conclusions, whatever they are. This movie does that. It's, I don't think you can walk away from it without feeling its impact and having the issues that it raises lingering in your mind. Uh, it's going to be released Friday. Uh, it will be available f- foremost on YouTube in the, in the Lifting Veils channel. We'll also be a streaming torrent of it, I think, from the Lifting the Veil website. We encourage people to 
to download the movie, burn it, circulate it any way they please. Uh, we may produce DVDs at some point. That's still under discussion, but people can certainly make their own DVDs. There will be high-resolution versions available. I just want I, I want to... I want to say again how grateful I am that I ran into Justin and what a what a thrill and a privilege it's been to work with an artist of his caliber on on putting my, my ideas into such a beautiful form. It is a thrill. Um, <laughs> they're top notch and with um, at lifting the veil in, in what they do and actually their their work has uh, inspired me greatly. And um, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if I hadn't run into them either. So Really? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So th- in case anyone doesn't know, the, the Lifting the Veil website is liftingtheveil.ca. And if anyone's interested in my book, it's certainly on Amazon, and it's distributed by the, the big anarchist distributor, AK Press, uh, which you can find at akpress.org. Yeah, so I mean that 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 brings us to another thing I wanted to talk about with you too is is um is anarchy. <laughs> My whole orientation towards the idea of anarchy has also been changed, you know, by um my discussions and with um Carrie Lee and Justin and 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 looking at their work. I mean, I see living examples of um the true meaning of of anarchy. You know, not uh, not the uh, the myth of anarchy, which is which is violence or violence oriented. The little guy in the black coat with the bomb. Right, right. And how interesting that 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 uh, perception, you know, has um, uh, continued for a long time. Um, and how interesting now that uh, how it's changing. I hope it is changing. The, the The impression isn't entirely wrong. There were there were some uh, very violent anarchist movements sure. uh, around the turn of the last century, and people people were furious. They called it propaganda of the deed. Uh, it wasn't enough to talk about getting rid of the state. You had to hit it, mm-hmm. and they were total failures. They were disastrous failures. Most anarchists. I believe, and certainly all the ones I know are pacifists who don't advocate any kind of, of, of aggressive violence whatsoever, in fact, the contrary. And to me, anarchism as an outlook shows that the violence and chaos is really political power's forte. You want to talk about violence and chaos, look at Hiroshima on August 6, 1945. Mm-hmm. It's hard to surpass that with a Molotov cocktail. To me, anarchism is a negative philosophy. It's not in the sense that it condemns armed central authority and political power, but I have no positive agenda with my anarchism. It's enough for me to say that that kind of political power is the problem and it has to be abolished. I want to leave it in the hands of individual communities around the world, if they ever have the opportunity, to organize their communities in whatever way they see fit. And I don't presume to limit how that ought to be to something narrow like anarcho-capitalism or anarcho-syndicalism or any kind of theoretical system. I think people are too ingenious for that. I think that once the opportunities begin to arise to organize communities in creative and novel ways, that we'll see things that completely surpass anything philosophers like me or the great ones have ever imagined for human community. And, of course, that's a remote possibility that that opportunity mm-hmm. will ever come into our hands. For in, for now, it's enough and it's crucial to state that it's political power itself that's the problem, that it's not one system or another that's the problem, or one kind of ruler or another that's the problem, that the machine that those rulers are operating is the thing that has to be done away with, or at least greatly throttled back and reformed so it's not nearly so destructive and, and, and powerful. That's enough job to keep us busy for decades or generations, I'm afraid. Mm-hmm. And in the meantime, of course, we can use whatever freedom we have 
to build alternative institutions for how we actually do live. And in so doing, connect with other people in community organizations and build a, that kind of organized strength that I was discussing earlier. Mm-hmm. Yeah. To put it in, in, in yeah. the terms of one of my favorite philosophers, Karl Popper, this, he was discussing something entirely different, but he said, I don't have to be able to define what good meat is to know meat gone bad. <laughs> Correct. Correct. And you can go a long way by just not eating bad meat. Yep. And, you know, that's what we've been eating for a little too long here. So Force-fed. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no permission was granted, folks. <laughs> I actually don't know anybody who calls themselves an anarchist and, and advocates violence. So I know they're out there, but I don't know any of them. <laughs> so the only... They're out there. Yeah, the only, I'm, yeah, they're out there. I know that. I just don't happen to know any of them. Um, there are certainly provocateur groups. Sure. I, I would bet a whole lot of money that a lot of the people who appear as so-called anarchists in these outbreaks of violence around demonstrations and so forth are provocateurs. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's that's a given, really. Um, and we see. It doesn't it, mean that all violent anarchists are, but I'm sure right. that they that those in power have. That that's the cap. Anarchism has been the greatest threat to power since the philosophy first emerged a couple of hundred years ago. Mm-hmm. There was a, a large part of the of the rise of fascism in Europe last century before the wars was to crush anarchist movements, and in particular the Spanish War, uh, the Spanish the Spanish War where Guernica happened that Picasso made his painting about, mm-hmm. the firebombing of that little town. There was an enormous anarchist movement in Spain then. In some parts of Spain, more than half of the land was had been put under worker control, mm. and and lots of the lots of the industries. And it wasn't just an industrial or agricultural movement; it was across the board anarchist movement. So it is the threat, and therefore it is the thing that those in power need to demonize. We have to be the bad guys who want to destroy everything and cause violence and chaos. Mm-hmm. which is just projecting their own image upon us. Mm-hmm. Exactly, which is what I was going to, exactly what I was going to say. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 that reinforces the myth, the myth of progress, the myth that we need um, armed central control to control us because our nature <laughs> is um, that of a psychopath, not that of a regular human. And it feeds on the idea that you have to have that armed central control to have order in society. Mm-hmm. That without it, there would be simply chaos. Of course, to those in power, losing power would be chaos. They would no longer have the the, the corporate elite in the United States would no longer have the United States government for its strongmen. It would no longer have a captive and deluded population to do its to do its work and to buy its products and so forth. That would be chaos. But the notion that without these kinds of central control, without strict law and order, courts, criminal justice, uh, education, blah, 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 that without that, the world would just simply go to hell because people are wild, crazy, violent, uncooperative beasts. That's essential to keeping the system in operation. And again, the example of relatively peaceful and egalitarian societies outside the pole of armed central authority show that that's simply not the case. Of course, if you removed political power at a fell swoop, we would really have a catastrophe because it's the life support system for so many billions of people. So fortunately, I don't think there's any way to do that without causing a tremendous amount of of bloodshed and destruction. But it shows that... why I believe that reform is the only way ahead, that we have to get out of the tentacles of the thing in how we live our lives, how we obtain our life support and so forth, because it's all tied up together and we're really dependent on the very thing that's feeding off us. And so it is maintained. I, you know, when you were talking, I was thinking about that's, that's why 
um, the idea of um, basically in, in, Indians before um, colonization were anarchists, <laughs> but Indians are sold as the the um, those are sold as savages as you know not having any um, organization or you know and that's part of the myth too you know that's sold both internally and externally the the, the uncontrollable savage the um, wild savage the same little savage that you have to lock up in the public schools for 12 years mm -hmm. so you can break their will and tame them into obedient conforming parts of the corporate machine yeah, and, you know, it, it really actually continues to this day um, because, let's say, for instance, um, Carlisle School, you know, where you, where it was a military man who ran, ran it, and the it was to kill, kill the Indian and save the man, right? And so there was Christian ideology used as well, and, you know, the hair was cut, you got put into white clothes, right? So where where is Carlisle now? Yeah, okay, it's still there, but they don't run the program. But in my opinion, they moved on over to Penn State, and now they're called the American Indian Leadership Program. You know where we where we teach uh, uh, Indians to go into traditionally white professions or you know assimilated professions, and then you take that assimilated. back. It's assimilated professions. You take that back to the reservation and and infect that <laughs> infect the reservation with it you know it's the same thing but it's still it's still happening but it it's it's sold as necessary for progression we're almighty progress mm -hmm. but and of course there's a hook there's a hook it really could make things better for lots of native americans to yeah. benefit from doing those things. That's the deadly thing, that, that power presents us with these opportunities. Just just yesterday, uh, a friend had gotten all upset. I live about 75 miles from the Los Alamos Laboratories, where the atomic bomb was invented. Mm -hmm. And the labs have, there's a lot of opposition in the state to the labs. They're the only reason that we're on the map. We're one of the poorest states, or maybe the poorest state in the United States, but Los Alamos, this this little town where the labs are, is one of the richest towns in the United States because of all the money that the labs bring in. Mm -hmm. They've done unbelievably horrible things. They've created unbelievably horrible things there, and that's their primary mission. So to counteract this, they have a massive outreach program where they support community businesses. They give them technological assistance. They give them grants. They, they buy friends in the community so that if someone comes out against the labs, the people who've gotten the assistance are threatened. And that makes a division between different parts of the community so people don't come out against the labs so much. It's it it's that's power. You aren't given the choice. You're in this situation. A friend this came up because a friend of mine just found out that a friend of hers had received uh, such a grant and she was kind of appalled at, at at thinking of that but what do you do you're a small businessman you're offered through the state the lab doesn't apparently do it directly you're offered an assistance that could make all the difference in your career and you're doing something good i mean say say that you're uh, advancing some kind of solar powered heating system or something like that of course there are many reasons why you should do it, aren't there? Right. And then, who can blame you? But that's how power works. It's like the Godfather said, make them an offer they can't refuse. Mm -hmm. It's a dirty game. But at least you can be aware of the game, if nothing more. Yep. And, you know, for natives, education is used as the... Uh the dangling carrot of, of progress. Um, the, that education will get you out of the reservation. But but really, you just go back. Because that's, you know, there's no um, cultural, uh, 
you, you can't be fed culturally outside of it. So you go back to give back whatever you got from getting educated, you know. Um, and sometimes you can do some good that way. Yeah, yeah, but absolutely. The assimilation continues at the same time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it, it's it's actually the impossible choice, you know. Um, do you want to live in poverty um, on the reservation with um, cultural immersion with your you know, your family ties and your language and everything? Or do you want to live a little bit better than that, a little farther away? And that's, you know, that's the choice. That And, and that's, again, it's all how it keeps the, the engine going, as well as doing good. But the, the, the myth that education is going to improve your... Um, improve your well-being, improve your life, improve your ability to have a livelihood is is absolutely false. Um, we because of how it's structured to for profit, you know, so we we go for it and then we have this debt that we can't pay, can or can't pay, you know, but still you start out in debt, so how does that make your life better? It makes you reliable. Right. If you look at if, if you look at education, certainly public education in the United States through higher education, the overwhelming lesson you learn from day one is that you have to be where you are told to be, when you are told to be, and do what you are told to do. Submit to authorities or be punished, and carry out tasks that you must do to your best ability, whether they interest you or not or benefit you or not. Now there, that may bring you a lot of good when you have good teachers in good schools, you can also learn a lot, you can also develop a lot of capabilities, and you can come through the process much better off than you were before. You, I, I should mention that I was a teacher for 35 years. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, just, I'm not just raving about some abstract thing. Right. Uh, the overwhelming thing it does is accustom one to authority, to performing at tasks that one is assigned under stress and coming through, and to competing with others and to acting in concert with others. It isn't like, you do this, Johnny, and you do this, Susie. It's like, class, here is the assignment. So you're part of a collective of people who have to obey an authority. Mm-hmm. That's the overwhelming, the, the overriding lesson that is driven home and that people who succeed at school have succeeded at. Now, they can turn that ability to their advantage consciously and do good with it, but statistically, far and away, that most often simply makes people fit into the mechanism better, whether it lands them in a, in a, high, in a good career or a high-paying job or in the military or in prison. Mm-hmm. They've had the necessary obedience training. Right. Yeah. And I say I, my sister is a teacher as well. Um, and she teaches high school. And, uh, but... I also think I am a teacher as well, but I'm not a sanctioned teacher. So, <laughs> so I do this instead because my ideas um, are not sanctioned by the by the, uh, the mechanisms in place. <laughs> so, well, neither were mine. Fortunately, yeah. I taught mathematics privately to college students for for most of that time, and then I I ran across the most wonderful little school here in Taos called Chamisa Mesa High School. Uh, taught there 12 years, the last 12 years of my career. I guess it's reputed as a hippie high, but it wasn't. It was a college prep school. Nine out of ten of our kids went to college. I never, I'm, I'm totally unqualified by state standards to teach, but that wasn't necessary there. I was able to teach my own ideas when I when they were appropriate. I was able to design my own math courses instead of using the tech garbage textbooks that they're forced to use by school boards usually. And it was a wonderful experience to really be able to treat kids as human beings and to be on a a friendly, not an authoritarian basis with them most of the time. Uh, Education is, at its best, it's one of the the most powerful things we've got going for us. Yes, yes. And there is enough freedom still left where we can be innovative, um, either in or outside of the the system, you know. Um, I send my kid to to public school, and uh, 
I make the best of of what uh, they offer him, and he tell he tells me everything, so I can tell him when I don't ag- <laughs> agree with what he's been taught. So, for instance, he brings home the the food pyramid because they're still teaching that in school, mm-hmm. you know. And I I'm more of let's let's look at nutrition from an an evolutionary perspective, and and that's one way that we can we can help heal ourselves. Um, cause my, my husband is full-blooded native and I'm part native. So, um, you know, I'm raising a native kid and, uh, that, that, um, food pyramid is going to, is going to be unhealthy for, for him. And I actually, I think all kids, but, um, so I said, no, actually, you know, that's not how we, how we do things <laughs> to make ourselves healthy. Yeah, the, food, the food pyramid is, is designed to benefit all the different aspects of the food industry. How can you possibly how can you possibly not let your your child do that? Right. Exactly. Yeah. But it, I mean, it's getting harder and harder to, uh, you know, um, get proper nutrition uh, for yourself and your family. Um, so we. That's another part of the human emergency, right there. Um, sure is. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we're going. It's going to take a lot of created creativity to um, tackle just that alone, just our food, you know, and solving that um, emergency. Um, That's one really promising place where communities can come together, even if in small ways. Mm-hmm. They they build local food production. That's what brings people together as a community, and can plant the seeds for the kind of organizing that I said are are absolutely necessary for having any real effect on reforming political power. We're, we're atomized. You know, we we don't live where we grew up. We live in little teeny families instead of extended families. We we are cut off from everybody we like while we're at work all day with people we may not like and have very little in common with. All Anything that can counteract that, especially around something as essential as life support, is great healing medicine for bringing back that community-based human nature that ties us together and makes us so strong. Oh, absolutely. And I think that's probably, um, you know, one of the main ways that um, we we can um, come together, like, right now. And I noticed myself, I've, I've been a part of many different uh, community gardens, and... Um, it immediately brings people together, um, it instantly, and and also focuses your attention on what's important, and it te- and it teaches and um, the children as well, and they're immediately interested. Um, children and families coming together, and we have our own garden, and naturally we just started having friends, you know, plant their stuff here too that don't have the space to do that. And uh, it, it, it's a natural community builder site. I encourage anybody that can to dig in the dirt. Plus, you know, it's an antidepressant, you know, and, and, it's, and it's cheaper than therapy as well <laughs> and drugs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I would highly encourage anybody to do that. And it's helped me tremendously, um, not only to, to build community in my own life, but just to connect to being to what it means to be human. So we're about um, 20 minutes from the end of the show. Um, do you want to see if there's any questions in the chat room, perhaps? Um, or is there anything else you'd like to get out before you know we end in about 20 minutes here? If there's any questions, that would be great. Okay. Let me see. I'm just I'm seeing a lot of um, not so much questions, but um, Add, you know, like people adding to the conversation. For instance, um, one of the people in the chat room is we're talking about the the poisoning, and he and and he's saying that thallium and arsenic in California, um, and talking about those compounds. I don't know anything about those, but they don't sound good to me. And I haven't heard about that uh, accident. There's so many every day, and. I usually get the ones from West Virginia since I'm right on the border. Poisoning is a really good example of how the corporations will 
will do things that make greater profits regardless of their destructive impact. Mm-hmm. You, it's very easy. I don't mean that these people are like at, at Monsanto or sitting in their boardroom saying, how can we sell poisons to kill people for money? It's very easy to convince yourself, especially if you've got a lot of scientific experts in your in your your little corporate court, so to speak, who are willing to provide evidence to that effect. It's easy to convince yourself that what you're doing is harmless or beneficial, and I'm sure that most of these people do. But when it's a choice of astronomical profits from pursuing some course of action, you know, you know where the reasoning is going to drift. Uh, same thing with climate change. I suspect a lot of people sincerely believe that that no matter whether physics says if you put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, there will be increased greenhouse heating. Leave that aside. That it's really not what the industries are doing. It's a natural climate cycle, and so forth. The rationalizations mm-hmm. will naturally come to hand around policies that naturally increase those dividends. And it can take pretty catastrophic effects on people's lives and big exposés of that effect to to reverse the policies that the corporations have been that a corporation's been following to make so much money. Mhm. And when you try to uh, say, "Hey, look, the these are the, the facts here about what this, whatever, Roundup is doing or, you know, gluten, whatever, GMOs. Um, you always get these, well, these peer-reviewed this and that and this peer-reviewed this and that, and you're wrong. You need to listen to the scientists, and how dare you question, you know, our, our scientific authority, basically, is what you get. And it's like, well, um, I think we've proved quite some time ago that the peer review system is, is um is corrupted and utterly flawed so um it hasn't protected us from anything has it no it didn't protect us from aspartame you know it didn't protect us from any of the drugs that have gotten out that have killed people um so what is it worth well and the, the question shouldn't be can you prove that it's harmful mm-hmm. i believe the burden should be on the the purveyor of these things to have established conclusively that they are safe before selling them. Absolutely. And that's the that's the problem right there. They don't have to. Why don't they have they to? They sure don't have to. <laughs> yeah. A business a food business is generally required to follow practices that pretty much guarantee that the food it serves is is safe. Because yeah. that's a well known process, you know. Uh, maybe employees wear hairnets, blah, blah, blah. There, you know, there are certain precautions you take that generally pretty much ensure that when you're serving food, the food you're serving is safe, you know, safe from disease and, and stuff like that. The stuff these corporations are doing is out in blue skies. Who knows what you need to do to ensure that a, genotic, a genetically modified variant of a crop is going to be a safe and wholesome member of an ecology. Mm-hmm. And it, That's, so, and it, there's no way to do that. Right. So the fact that they're out in those blue skies, even if it were legally possible to require them to demonstrate that what they're they're selling is is good for people and safe, couldn't be done. So darn, that would mean not having those huge profits. Mm-hmm. So that's why that control is not in, in place. Um, I'm and afraid so in the system we have today. So we have, um, we do have a question. Let's see. Um, where does Mark think the greatest progress is to be made that will advance, that will advantage a starting point in the engine? I, is it action or knowledge? Oh, that's a loaded question. Mm-hmm. As if it were one or the other. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll be I'll be tricky here, and I'll say the greatest starting place is to take the action of spreading knowledge. 
because that's what everyone can do. If people don't take action, if they just sit in their inside their skulls and think better or un- understand better, that's good, but it won't have any effect on the world. It's only action that will change how the world is. So I'd say become knowledgeable and take action based on that knowledge to spread that knowledge only as a first step because without action to change how things are done, that won't make any difference either, but that will make it more likely that that action will be taken even if you don't take it. Right. Right. We, we have another question too. Okay. All right. So here's someone who, um, who, who kind of sees things like I do with my, with my blog that, you know, if you look at all the messed up stuff in the world, you know, it's psychopaths are running things. So that's, that's the root cause. And we talked about, we did talk about this early, earlier how, um, you know, I'm seeing that, yeah, okay, we could see it as a root cause. But it's also a, um, a necessity for those people to be in, in places of um, power um, for the engine to work. And so that's why they're there. So They're powerless without it. These institutions require, enable, and reward the worst capabilities of human beings. Without the institutions... The psychopaths would only be able to do harm on a personal scale. Those are the psychopaths who are actually out to do harm. Mm -hmm. It's the institutions that are the problem. It's very important not to make it a good guys, bad guys drama. Mm -hmm. Oh, the 1%. Oh, the psychopaths. Oh, the capitalists or whatever kind of bad guy you want. There's always going to be enough bad guys to cause a lot of harm if they have the wherewithal to do the harm. So remove the wherewithal. That's a creative uh, thought in itself to remove the the I mean, if, if somebody's threatening you with a gun, if at all possible, you simply want to take the gun away. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's hard to do with a gun, but you get my point. It, it without the institutions, the harm would be absolutely impossible. And by reforming the institutions, we can make it harder to cause so much harm. So with the, um, the institutions themselves, I mean, many of them, I'm sure, you know, only exist because of that engine and aren't even a necessity in and of themselves. Um, you know, once we're changed by this idea of of power, of political power, you know, we may at some point look look at these and say, how, why do they even exist? Many of them, I would say. Well, very likely so. I, I should say that when I say institutions, I mean technically what I call the components of the engine in my theory. Okay. Not, not, they're not at all identical with the institutions that, that people are familiar with, like post offices. Or, right, right, right. Or, or, or it's, they're, they're much more abstract than that. They're ways of, of controlling human energy, like the hierarchical command structure is one. Mm-hmm. Land holding by force of arms, where a regime controls a region, mm-hmm. borders, states, in that sense. You know, that this is America. Well, why? Because on that side of the fence, it's Canada. The land holding by force of arms, which requires a military, um, there has to be some institutions that produce the physical wherewithal that those in power need. They need weapons. They need housing. They need basically everything everyone in the community needs and a whole lot more, like some way to confine prisoners and all kinds of other stuff. So you have to have a lot of physical industries. You also need some way of getting labor when people don't feel like working for you. And that could be something as crude as slavery or or something as sophisticated as taxation, where you're essentially making a person work for nothing for part of their time, which they would not do otherwise. They would not work. Would, would you rather work four-fifths as long mm. uh, at the same wages or work your, the eight-hour day you've got to work and have a fifth of it taken out in taxes? So you need some way of getting labor without the consent of the person who's laboring when they won't consent to it. 
you need a way of fooling people into believing that what you're doing is not just pure selfish malice. You need a way of bribing people to some extent, like we were talking about earlier, or even just like the you know the opportunities that a, a successful career affords you to acting in compliant ways. And finally, you need some, some institution in a large system of power, in a large engine, you need an institution that justifies it when you kill people, whether it's capital punishment or war or just shooting uh, people on the street when you're a police officer. You need to be able to justify violence against your subjects or against people outside your regime. Those are the institutions that I mean need uh-huh. to be reformed. The specific forms they take in different systems of political power can be quite different. Right. Yeah, and I mean, it's the natural natural outgrowth of that, of your theory is to, and I, and I have to keep saying it moves forward, but it, that's, again, the only language we have right now. But I'm, and, but as the, as this gets into our thoughts, um, it changes our language too. And, you know, we don't always have the language to describe the, the, um, you know, we don't always have the language to, to describe what's coming next because we don't know. So it looks like we're, we're pretty much reaching our end here. We, we do have some chat room discussion, but I don't think there's any more questions. And, um, I certainly would love to have you back, um, once I've gotten a chance to read through the whole book and I would encourage others to read the book, um, get the book and, uh, definitely on Friday, the 17th, check out Lifting the Veil's visual representation of Engines of Domination. And I thank you again, Mark, for um, joining me here today to talk about your work. We appreciate it. It's, it's really been fun, Kira. I've had a wonderful time. and uh, Please do. I'd, I'd, love to, I'd love to talk further when, you, when you've read the rest of the book. I'm sure it'll raise a lot of questions. And maybe, maybe your friends will have questions in the meantime. I just want to urge everyone to check out this movie. If, if anything I say sounds interesting, in one hour you can get a really good look at my basic outlook and, and think it over for yourself. Agree or disagree, I don't care. And plus, I think you'll have a really wonderful time seeing how Justin Jasuski adapted it as just a stunning cinematic experience, really moving. I'm really excited about it, and um, I can't wait to see it myself. So everybody check that out. Go um, and check out everything else that Lifting the Veil has done, too, because their work is top-notch and, um, you know, it's definitely changed my life as well. Thanks again, Mark. The film's, title is, the film's title is Mark Korsky's Engines of Domination. Google it or go to the Lifting Veils YouTube channel to find it. Yep. Until Friday, there are some uh, promos that are out that you can check out as well. There's a beautiful trailer. Yep. All right. Thanks again, Mark. And we'll talk to you again. You're very welcome. Thank you, Kira.